Okay. So let me uh, get some of this material out of the way. Well, while I'm getting this presentation organized, I'm Jerry DeVore. I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, board certified in biofeedback and in neurofeedback. Uh, I just love this field, and I'm particularly interested in, uh, and have been for quite some time, uh, in the nature of uh, alpha-theta training. And uh, so I hope to share uh, with you some of the uh, things that I have found are very exciting, and I'm also interested in the nice things about a live presentation is that uh, you get a chance to ask questions and, and offer further insights. Uh, I'm particularly uh, interested in uh, Jay Gunkelman's uh, thoughts and comments uh, as, we, uh, as we move into some areas. Um, and let me just make sure, is, is everybody hearing me and seeing the, uh, the presentation? Coming through loud and clear. Excellent. So, I've so I started this area of uh, being interested in alpha theta training uh, with a question. I, I had read uh, Elmer Green's book uh, Biofeedback and Beyond. Uh, I'd read about the Peniston Protocol, and I'd also uh, read uh, Grueslier and others. Uh, who noted that alpha theta training uh, was well documented to uh, produce very high success rates in substance abuse remission. Um, fewer research articles on PTSD resolution, uh, but nevertheless uh, uh, very interesting favorable results. And in non-clinical population, it enhances well-being and creativity. Now, alpha-theta training is actually a fairly simple protocol to implement. Uh, anybody who has at least a one-channel neurofeedback system can uh, probably implement uh, such a protocol. And I've been scratching my head uh, and reading all the literature, asking myself, how can such a simple intervention accomplish so much? It seems, uh, uh, I guess if I took a little skepticism, I could say it seems uh, uh, too good to be true. And so over the past uh, years, uh, as I've read lots of literature, uh, I've formulated uh, not the answer, but at least an answer. Uh, and uh, so what I plan to do is go through this answer and then uh, go through the data that, uh, that supports this kind of answer. So the first part is the alpha uh, training and alpha-theta training both produce uh, remarkable clinical outcomes and enhance functioning in non-clinical populations uh, because they strengthen and maintain a state called hypnagogy. And I'm hoping that everybody is somewhat familiar with the state, but just to, uh, uh, to get a little technical, hypnagogy is a major normal state of consciousness it's in between uh, the phase where we uh, have our eyes open or are waking and grappling with the world. When we close our eyes, uh, some very interesting things happen uh, uh, that start off with uh, enhanced uh, alpha in most people. But then there are some phases that the uh, brain and mind goes through uh, that uh, is bracketed by sleep on the other end. So uh, you're still awake in hypnagogia. But uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, it can be tracked with the eyes closed EEG. It shows a characteristic pattern of increased alpha uh, initially, and that, if you track it over time, spontaneously decreases. And, uh, and towards the boundary of sleep, you see a, a, a significant increase in theta and delta. So they become the dominant rhythm in the posterior areas, and uh, some people have even 
thought that they become the dominant rhythm in the frontal areas, especially around FZ. Uh, neurophysiologically, in theta crossover states of hypnagogia, hypnagogia when you do, uh, uh, or at least my, my limited uh, uh, studies indicate that, that when I when I do a, a Loretta or S. Loretta analysis uh, of a theta crossover state, that the posterior cingulate cortex and the default mode network in general, but especially the posterior cingulate cortex, uh, are uh, they're less metabolically active as shown uh, shown in the fMRIs in the and they are uh, beta drops out, and, and theta is uh, pronounced in the in the Loretta findings. Biologically, uh, hypnagogia is associated with reduced motor activity, reduced emotional activation, activation, a reduced cognitive problem solving, reduced ruminations, and reduced self-reflection. Essentially, the mind and body are at rest. And that rest facilitates moving into sleep at night. And in fact, one of the reasons why we don't often know very much about hypnagogia is because even though it's a normal state, it, it tends to be regarded as a transition state where we move from eyes open, actively problem solving and engaging in the, meeting the demands of the sensory world to shutting all that off so we can move into stages of sleep and get our uh, deep restorative sleep and our emotional reorganizing the phases of, uh, of uh, dreaming and REM sleep. But uh, when we deliberately intensify and sustain hypnagogia, um, we can get many of the benefits of meditation also turns out that the hypnagogic state significantly increases uh, hypnotic responsiveness and creative ideation. And intrigued, back to the, uh, the answer, a meditation is classically and clinically associated with decreased cravings and aversion, decreased mental turmoil, increased mental peace, increased creativity, and increased post-meditation concentration. So we've got all those benefits with meditation. It seems like alpha-theta training tends to concentrate and enhance those benefits. Um, and that may well be how alpha-theta training uh, accomplishes uh, all the wonderful things that the, that the research uh, has said about it. So I'd like to take you uh, on a little walk through history. Most everybody knows that uh, uh, Hans Berger in uh, 1929 uh, pub published his observations of the alpha rhythm. Um, and the alpha rhythm was uh, very easy to, to visualize, uh, and it at least had some interesting behavioral properties. So when you closed your eyes, the alpha rhythm was prominent. When you open your eyes, the alpha rhythm, for most people, uh, dwindles. Uh, just in case people are unfamiliar with a live recording of, uh, of alpha, alpha rhythms, because uh, I've seen in lots of textbooks, people instead of showing you what an EEG looks like, they draw pictures of EEGs that often have little to do with, the, with what an EEG looks like. So on the left, we have the eyes open, and we see some uh, fast rhythmic beta. But over here on the right, this little phase that I'm pointing to right here, and this little phase right here, is those are alpha spindles. And you can see that they're rather large waves that are regular. The reason why we know they're, uh, they're, they're alpha, because the alpha frequencies are sort of designated in between about 8 hertz to 12 hertz. And we see here on the software that, uh, that we've got a spike at 10 hertz. Over here with the eyes open, 
We've got a little blip at 10 hertz, uh, but it's nowhere near as dominant as uh, with the eyes closed. So that was the... Uh, uh, Berger didn't have this fancy uh, display technology, uh, but he was able to see the alpha pattern. And uh, from then until about the 60s, there was a lots of speculation and data gathering uh, with, uh, with raw EEGs. Uh, clinically, they had an important uh, contribution to, uh, to identifying uh, uh, seizure disorders and also to, uh, uh, to mark various uh, stages and phases of sleep. And people had speculated that the EEG may have important relationships to uh, uh, to behavior, uh, but drawing out those relationships uh, was kind of sporadic um, and not very convincing. Uh, in the early 60s, uh, Joe Camilla demonstrated that uh, he could look at an alpha, or he could look at an EEG display and tell people whenever they were in alpha uh, and and after uh, kind of giving verbal cues that they were in alpha then he could actually uh, have them monitor their own subjective states and he would ask them well are you what state are you in and they could accurately identify whether they were in an alpha state or not and uh, and they also gave them uh, rewards whenever they generated uh, uh, alpha states, and he found that uh, the number of alpha spindles per unit of time could be increased via operant conditioning. Yeah, he was pretty excited about that, and intriguingly, his, uh, he had a, uh, a major publication in Psychology Today uh, that excited the imaginations of uh, quite a number of people, uh, in part because uh, he also uh, not only looked at the ability to operantly train alpha, but he also asked people uh, what they felt. And they reported that when they were uh, in a higher alpha state, uh, that they felt calm and, and relaxed. Uh, some people found that uh, uh, creative ideas uh, flowed more frequently. In fact, Camilla in... Uh, and describing his initial research said, well, initially you had to pay research subjects to uh, come in and, and go through this training. But as his research progressed, people were kind of beating down the doors, uh, even wanting to pay in order to, to have an opportunity to, to be a research subject just because uh, alpha training seemed to be such a reinforcing experience. So a few years later, Elmer Green, uh, one of the founding fathers of initially the uh, Society for Biofeedback, now known as the uh, AAPB, uh, had pioneered a number of areas of biofeedback, including uh, temperature training and uh, using uh, SEMG. And he was also uh, one of the early pioneers of, of working with uh, brainwave biofeedback. And I'm not sure exactly what inspired him to add uh, augmenting theta to alpha, but he developed a protocol in which uh, you got a reward tone if alpha went up, a reward tone if your theta went up, and a reward tone, or not a reward tone, but at least a tone when beta went up. And the task was to uh, to develop a state in which the alpha or theta was up and, and the beta was down. Now these were all separate tones uh, that were, uh, I think, part of a, a chord so that they were harmonious. And so the individual could, uh, you could potentially have alpha over the threshold, you could potentially have theta over the threshold, but you were also uh, encouraged to keep beta silent. So in such a state, uh, 
as uh, people cultivated those states after several training sessions, uh, they noticed that uh, very interesting things began to happen. They, they began to have hypnagogic imagery. Uh, they noticed that they felt better, uh, and they were really relaxed and peaceful. Well, Albert Green was so taken by this that he, uh, he wrote a whole paper entitled uh, Alpha Theta uh, Instrumental Vipassana. Uh, and so he, he had formulated the, uh, the idea that, uh, that this was a, a way to actually keep score uh, when you're meditating, because meditation has uh, been a practice that has been cultivated by hundreds of thousands of people over the last uh, 2,500 years. Um, but you were sort of at the mercy of either what you thought you understood or you were at the mercy of a master who would tell you whether you were meditating adequately or not. And one of the nice things about the, uh, uh, the instrumented uh, mode of, of uh, meditation is that uh, the, uh, the neurofeedback device will tell you uh, whether you're in the, uh, the meditative state or not. And there's some thought that instead of taking years to develop a, a good state of mindfulness, uh, it may just take a, a few days of training. So Elmer Green uh, refined his, uh, his procedures and, and his protocol and, and managed to recruit a number of interesting students and, uh, and subjects. Uh, I think Stanislav Grof was one of the subjects of his uh, protocols and, uh, and, and went, put them through Alpha Theta training. And virtually everybody said that, well, when you get into, especially in that uh, Theta state, it seemed to be a very desirable feelings of well-being developed, hypnagogic imagery, and the creative imagery uh, developed. So, uh, so those were some of the, the inspiring ideas that Elmer Green had. One of the students of Elmer Green was Eugene Peniston. And we'll talk about him in just a moment, but uh, uh, when we start looking at the, from the foundation uh, pilots, then we want to we move into to clinical applications. Uh, and it turns out that uh, while Camille didn't really do much to develop clinical applica applications, uh, two other folks who have uh, had some uh, some degree of fame in the area of uh, neurofeedback. Uh, Les Femi uh, got very interested in alpha training, did some, uh, some initial research, then developed a, uh, a five-channel uh, method of phase synchrony training uh, that also included a, a kind of meditation practice that he calls an open focus meditation. Uh, it used to be at AAPB meetings that Les Femi would, would have uh, uh, seminars and workshops that, uh, that would uh, give a person a chance to review and actually experience some of that. Uh, he's still uh, active in, in, in doing workshops in various places, uh, but he hasn't been active in doing any kind of research or extending uh, his model in an empirical way. He's been more interested in recruiting people to, uh, to participate in the uh, open focus meditation and, uh, and using especially the alpha phase synchrony uh, to uh, reduce psychophysiological disorders and to, uh, and to promote a meditative clear mind. Um, Hart was also initially uh, uh, an alpha training researcher who did some very good work at, at identifying uh, the conditions for increasing uh, or out, augmenting the alpha signal. Uh, and that allowed him to, to 
to demonstrate that some researchers who were investigating this area were using protocols that were unlikely to be successful. So when their research demonstrated a, a non-significant result, that really wasn't demonstrating the lack of impact of alpha training. That was demonstrating the impact of poor research design. And uh, yeah, I identified some of the conditions for actually facilitating a good, strong alpha response. And then he went on to, uh, to move out of the research mode and into the application mode, uh, developing a program that he calls the BioCybernaut program uh, that involves initially a four-channel alpha training in which you, uh, each channel produces a tone and the tones are arranged in a, in a chord so that as you uh, uh, have a signal that's, that's over the threshold in each of those channels, uh, the, the, the chord will, uh, will uh, get more rich and harmonious. And you do a few sessions of just being able to uh, generate an, an augmented alpha signal, and then he switches to uh, alpha phase synchrony training. And, uh, and people have reported remarkable uh, remissions from uh, psychophysiological disorders, as well as uh, significant increases in creative ideation and uh, ability to uh, uh, to meet problems with uh, uh, feeling like they're they're optimally tuned up. Uh, Penniston uh, took the Elmer Green material and and actually applied that to significant a uh, significant clinical problem uh, he was working in VA with uh, in uh, residential programs in which people had significant substance abuse and he actually developed a uh, program where uh, the experimental group got the normal residential treatment and in addition uh, they got uh, intensive training in uh, generating alpha theta states and the control group continued with the ordinary training. What was quite remarkable about his research is that uh, in the area of substance abuse, getting significant re remissions, uh, typically uh, the, the best programs have uh, far less than a 40% a successful outcome at one year or longer. And Penniston got an 80% successful remission uh, at one year. And that, that success rate has been followed, I think, over three years. And I think there was a review that, looked, that even went uh, longer than that. And that 80% remission uh, uh, remained. When I read that, uh, it, knocked my socks off. <laughs> I wondered how in the world uh, could this be true and how come this isn't the dominant mode of doing uh, substance abuse treatment with such a success rate. Well, Penniston, when he presented his findings, uh, did get uh, quite a number of challenges and probably the one that, that, that sticks the most is that it was a, a small n sample. And we also know that research, you know, a single person doing a, a single study uh, can be interesting, uh, but uh, we develop our sense of interest and, and credibility and the feeling like that we're really getting somewhere when you've got independent researchers also using uh, uh, control groups and and coming up with, with similar kinds of findings. So it turns out that there are two other nice studies. Uh, M.J. Kelly uh, used 
alpha theta neurofeedback with a DNA or Navajo population with polysubstance abuse had a three-year follow-up uh, with high, very high success rates. And then uh, Bill Scott and David Kaiser and, and others um, had a sample of 121 cases randomly assigned to uh, alpha-theta neurofeedback versus control in a residential uh, treatment program. Very similar to the Peniston uh, research, they got a 77% successful remission at 12 months compared to the control group, uh, that was 44% abstinence. So even the control group um, got a higher than, uh, than usual rate of success via the residential program, but the, uh, the presence of the alpha-theta neurofeedback just about doubles the success rate. Um, Another unique aspect is they, uh, they recognized that there was a lot of people who had problems with wandering attention and they used beta and SMR feedback to address those problems for the people who had them uh, before instituting the alpha-theta feedback with them. And then Jay Gunkelman uh, reported uh, uh, doing some research in, with an N of 30. Uh, that was a case series. And uh, he was classifying these cases by uh, EEG phenotypes and discussed some individual cases uh, without reporting the general outcome statistics, but very intriguingly noted that with some phenotypes, uh, particularly ones who seem to have uh, insufficient slow waves, doing slow wave up, up training made rational sense and uh, not only had the, the benefit of increasing the slow waves in those folks, but uh, also had significant other ramifications in, in improving their lives. So that was one of the nice things about his individual case look is that when people successfully responded to uh, to neurofeedback training based on their EEG phenotype, uh, they also, uh, they not only showed improvements in their EEG, they showed improvements in quite a variety of areas of life. This is actually consistent with the, the Penniston research because when Penniston looked at the outcomes, uh, he was looking not only at uh, remission from substance abuse. He'd used uh, the MMPI and the MCMI and was able to document uh, widespread uh, personality changes in a, in a beneficial direction as well as decrease in PTSD and depression symptoms. And then in the entirely different uh, country in uh, in uh, England, uh, Grueslier and, and Associates uh, also were exploring alpha-theta training, but they were doing that uh, with, uh, with non-clinical subjects, kind of working off the idea that uh, Eugene Gendlin had thought that, that alpha-theta training could enhance creativity and because people in the pilot study reported that. But Grizzlier initially looked at college students in the uh, uh, performing arts and especially uh, music students. And with 10 weeks of twice weekly alpha theta training, uh, the, the students who had had the alpha theta training on top of their normal uh, uh, music studies compared to control group who just had the normal studies were rated uh, when, the, when the students uh, did a uh, musical performance, they were rated by judges who were unaware of uh, the training status. They, they noticed that uh, they were rated these, these students who had had alpha theta training with significantly enhanced uh, creativity. And then he looked at musical expression in, uh, in grade school students, uh, students about 11 years old, 
found the same results when you when you run them through alpha theta training. Uh, it's not just college students. Uh, the grade school students can uh, really learn to uh, be more creative in their, their musical performance. He also studied uh, the promotion of creativity in dance and in dramatic acting, finding all, in all cases that when people went through alpha theta training that uh, their ability to add creative dimensions to, uh, to their performance was dramatically increased. So we have uh, basically a, what to my mind is, is a really significant trend in data that suggests that alpha theta training uh, is very powerful in producing useful clinical effects and also very powerful as a form of optimizing functioning, especially uh, creativity in, in non-clinical cases. So that to me kind of says, well, this is not a, a, a single enthusiast being excited about something. This is uh, a sustained body of research uh, indicating something that's really exciting and to me still um, generating the question of, well, what can explain both the clinical problem resolution and uh, the dramatic increase in creativity. And here I've uh, labeled this slide hypnagogia. And hypnagogia has been a state um, only recently attached to that label, but, but practices producing this eyes closed waking state in which dreamlike imagery occurs has, has been cultivated um, for millennia. And one of the first persons that really explored the literature of these states and the, the potential significance for psychological growth and, and an enhanced understanding of consciousness was uh, Mary Watkins uh, in her book called Waking Dreams. Uh, she uh, had a detailed history uh, of the ebb and flow of interest in these kinds of states and then also looking at uh, uh, clinical applications of these states for for producing growth and and creativity and then even more so a fellow named Mavra Mattis wrote probably the Bible of hypnagogia um, and and he did a major review of research to include uh, uh, looking at uh, biofeedback, looking at flotation tanks, uh, looking at uh, a variety of different ways to in, induce hypnagogic states. One of the nice things about Mavromatis is uh, early in his book he has a way to to rate hypnagogic uh, imagery uh, that, that can be useful in identifying uh, uh, whether you're in more of a surface state or more of a deeper state. And then we come to, to Elmer Green, who had actually in his writings uh, basically expressed and, and thought that Alpha Theta uh, training facilitated hypnagogic states. Later on, uh, Tom Budzinski, uh, who I had the pleasure of uh, attending several meetings with, uh, pioneered the, the whole idea of twilight learning, uh, tried to uh, market an, a, a, a theta trainer and didn't get very far with his marketing, but he did get, uh, it excited me and a number of other folks because uh, you notice that when we're in a theta state, not only do we have interesting imagery, but we're more responsive to suggestions. They tend to, 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 uh, to stick in us. Uh, more readily. Then I've got these uh, the names Kroger and, and, and Seaver, as in David Seaver, uh, the uh, 
one of our faculty members who uh, who works with audiovisual stimulation. William Kroger may be less known. He was actually one of the co-founders of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, along with Milton Erickson. Uh, Kroger at the time was was noted as a masterful clinician using uh, hypnosis to, uh, to attain quite a variety of uh, therapeutic and performance enhancing objectives. But he noted that often hypnosis required uh, some time to develop a, a satisfactory hypnotic trance. And he had uh, reviewed some of the literature that uh, I believe William Penfield developed in, in using photic stimulation uh, to produce alterations in brain functioning and, and states of consciousness. And he developed a, uh, I think a Xeon light uh, that could flash at 10 hertz. And he would, uh, there was an extremely bright light, he would, have, he would, he could, use this with a group of people where you put the light on and uh, have people uh, look at it until their eyes felt heavy and, and, uh, and they were ready to go into a trance. What he found is that uh, in about six minutes, about 50% of any given audience would be in a deep hypnotic trance and another 30% would be in a moderate to light hypnotic trance. And, uh, and whether you intended to go in trance or not. And so that was that was a kind of exciting finding. Uh, Dave Seaver reviews that material and has been a leading developer of audiovisual stimulation, including uh, the devices uh, far less expensive than the, the what Kroger initially used, and that can be produce a variety of frequencies. A receiver is also distinguished by doing a lot of field research, uh, looking at uh, the impact of audiovisual stimulation on uh, uh, to attain problem-solving objectives like reducing attention deficit disorder problems, reducing insomnia, uh, reducing psychophysiological stress as well as using, uh, using audiovisual stimulation for performance enhancement. Uh, and he, he too notes that, uh, that basically uh, if you're uh, stimulating at 10 hertz, uh, one of the things it produces is significant physiological relaxation that you can measure in terms of reduced muscle activation, uh, decreased skin conductance, increased skin temperature, and feelings of relaxation, peace, well-being, and then even hypnagogic imagery. And then a, uh, another local, Arid Barabaj, uh, has uh, really spanned quite a, quite a range of uh, uh, of explorations. He's uh, done significant work using uh, neurofeedback to, uh, to uh, work with children to reduce attention deficit disorder. But he's also noticed, noted in the hypnosis world for, uh, for developing a brief eyes open hypnotic, hypnotic procedures. And he has a significant body of research exploring uh, the psychology and psychophysiology of uh, restricted environmental stimulation. Uh, initially uh, uh, inspired by his wintering over in Antarctica and noticing how people responded to uh, such an unusual environment, uh, he uh, then began to explore uh, the psychophysiology and psychology of Flotation tanks, and then also uh, restricted environmental chambers in which uh, you weren't necessarily floating in an Epsom salt, but uh, that the lights were out, uh, uh, sounds were muffled. And one of the things that he found is that 
in these restricted environmental stimulation settings, uh, theta waves dramatically increase and hypnotizability dramatically increase, as well as um, pain decreases. And then we have some people who have contributed some fascinating electrophysiology. Barry Sturman and others uh, had been puzzled about the sources of, of different brain waves, including uh, the alpha and theta brain waves. And uh, Barry Sturman noted that uh, well, these waves typically are generated by the thalamus. And when they're being generated by the thalamus, uh, they tend to block uh, beta waves and, and, uh, and block the processing of sensory information. Sturman and Kaiser also did some fascinating research looking at ultradian rhythms. Uh, and they've published some findings looking at uh, the eyes open state throughout the day, noting that there was 90 to 120 minute cycles of alpha peaking. Part of what's interesting about that is we know in sleep research, there are also 90 to 120 minute cycles uh, that move through different phases of sleep. And it seems likely that what we're discovering is that uh, well, even with our eyes open, there are cycles of uh, more intense vigilance and, uh, and uh, more reduced vigilance or, or more rest. But then uh, the next uh, investigator, uh, uh, Gerald Ulrich, uh, wrote this nice book that really keyed on the importance of the spontaneous resting eyes closed EEG. And for that, you have to look at the EEG for 10 minutes or longer. And um, I looked at that, and that was kind of dramatically reorganized my thinking about the nature of EEGs and what we were learning from them, because I was used to, uh, to taking a three-minute sample and getting the uh, best one minute and, uh, and uh, subjecting that to quantitative analysis. And you can learn a lot by looking at, uh, at the normative EEG, but there's a tremendous amount that you can look at, you can learn by looking at uh, the, uh, the resting eyes closed EEG. And in fact, uh, Jay Gunkelman and Werner Vandenberg uh, uh, noted that uh, Ulrich himself had thought that you can just look at the EEG, and that was going to tell you uh, good information. But uh, those patterns can be subjected to uh, some quantitative analysis to look at different stages, uh, especially in that 10-minute cycle. And there's even some question about whether the 10-minute cycle uh, might be somewhat arbitrary, that there might be larger cycles like perhaps the 90 to 120 minute cycles, or the, the 20 to 30 minute cycles that are, are is recommended to, for as minimum for most people who are engaging in a meditation practice. So Gunkelman uh, summarized stages of vigilance of the eyes closed EEG, where you can notice in the first stage, that uh, alpha tends to dominate posterior sites. In the second stage, alpha dominates frontal and posterior sites. Then there's this stage where alpha seems to spontaneously decrease, and what you see is a lot of desynchronized beta in the uh, frontal and posterior uh, midline sites. And then there's another stage where theta and delta tend to dominate the, the frontal and posterior midline. Uh, and the, the next stage after that uh, is, is moving right into um, the K-complexes and sleep spindles that are associated 
with a stage of sleep. So the final aspect of, uh, of theory involves uh, mindfulness and the default mode network. A uh, prolific researcher, Judge Judson Brewer, and his associates uh, started off exploring uh, meditation using the fMRI. And what he found out was that mindfulness and other forms of meditation uh, significantly re re resulted in decreased activa activation of the posterior cingulate cortex, which is a major hub of the default mode network. And cases reported deep meditation when the posterior cingulate cortex was reduced. And when it wasn't reduced, uh, people noticed that they were intended to be caught up in their thoughts. Uh, so uh, an additional thing that Judson did was uh, he arranged for uh, real-time feedback while people were in the fMRI machine and found that posterior uh, cingulate uh, cortex activation or deactivation could be taught using fMRI neurofeedback. And in that kind of paradigm, while people are in the machine and uh, they're seeing when their PCC is going down and when it's going up, you can ask them, well, what are, you, what are you noticing? And people would notice that, well, when the PCC went down, they felt calmer, clearer, more deeper in their meditation. And when the activation went up, they felt more like they were thinking about things and caught up in their thinking. And another amazing kind of finding is that uh, Judson Brewer worked with nicotine abstinence uh, and found that uh, what decreasing the PCC does is decrease the craving. And that's a fairly momentous kind of finding because most substance abuse treatment teaches you how to cope with craving, uh, how to not give in to craving, but it doesn't teach you how to get rid of the craving. And, uh, and that may be a huge component of why uh, alpha theta training can be so successful if, in fact, what we're doing is decreasing the craving to begin with. Uh, Brewer and Associates noted that uh, EEG and maybe the Loretta EEG might target the PCC less expensively than the fMRI. Uh, and um, that's actually a next step in the, in the research that they're planning. So the next thing I want to do is I've tossed around this term theta crossover states. And, uh, and so I've got, a, uh, I've got recordings from a subject myself so that there's no issue of, uh, of release of confidentiality. This is a... Uh, a 30-minute uh, period of alpha-theta training. And you can see in this training, we start off, alpha is elevated. Uh, I'm, I'm only measuring one site, so we don't know, uh, we don't know in this particular recording uh, whether uh, the, the, this, is, this site is PZ. So we've got at least the, the Dunkelman stage A1, and, uh, and that alpha spontaneously decreases, despite the fact that there's a reward tone going on every time that there's the alpha exceeds threshold. There's a re record reward tone going on every time theta exceeds uh, threshold. Um, so despite those reward tones, and that will come, come back as important, uh, alpha spontaneously decreases. Beta and high beta go up a little bit. And then over here we have the magical mystery theta crossover state, where you can see this black line is uh, delta, and the dark blue purple line is, is theta, where theta is unambiguously uh, dominant along with theta, and high beta, alpha, and the normal beta have dramatically uh, decreased.
and just so uh, I could feel like I wasn't just getting fluke kind of findings, this is a different day in which I was training and we, here we have um, the alpha state kind of spontaneously moving into theta dominance. And then contingencies of reinforcement didn't change, but the uh, theta crossover state spontaneously subsided and, and alpha came back in spades. So, uh, so that was kind of an average of findings over time. Uh, I want to demonstrate that uh, here was eyes closed baseline data that uh, you can kind of see that alpha kind of peaks at about uh, 10 hertz. And you can see in this little snippet there's a significant alpha here, a significant alpha here. And um, so you get these spindles uh, combined with faster wave activity and then spontaneously creating uh, alpha spindles. Here's uh, eyes closed at the theta crossover state. So this is the baseline, yeah, that initial uh, alpha is dominant. At uh, theta crossover, uh, you don't see the alpha spindles. In fact, you kind of see huge spike at, at 5 hertz. You can see these um, kind of large, slow waves. So that's the raw picture. Then I've uh, I submitted this to uh, Loretta Processing. And what we're seeing here is the difference in the, in the raw signal with uh, the baseline eyes closed here and the theta crossover on the, on the left side. And you can see that uh, the area of the brain that is most affected in the theta crossover is, is the midline structures, uh, the, all along the cingulate cortex, with uh, uh, PZ especially. I also got excited to wonder about uh, um, so this is raw data, just looking at the raw uh, 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 raw signal. This is looking at the norm reference disease score. And uh, what you can see is uh, that in the ordinary baseline state, uh, there's actually some deficits in the, uh, the theta signal, the slow wave deficits that in the theta crossover stage are uh, pretty much completely resolved. There's a little bit on the, uh, on the left temporal region that isn't fully resolved. Excuse me, Jerry, you've only got about five yes. minutes left. Okay, well, I'm, I'm uh, coming to the end, so that's great timing. So this shows you simultaneously the, uh, the delta spreading through the entire uh, cingulate cortex. Uh, this shows the alpha, which was initially uh, higher, and then uh, in theta crossover uh, is uh, uh, so, uh, taken over by theta. Uh, just to be interesting, I also looked at, uh, at beta. So beta uh, it decreases. Also, gamma decreases. Uh, when I looked at normative uh, changes, I, I started looking at networks. So these are this is the anxiety network, mood network, uh, dorsal attention network, ventral attention, default mode network, uh, central executive system, salient system, and the pain network. So at baseline. Um, this this all comes from uh, NeuroGuide's uh, 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 symptom checklist and and uh, and Loretta neurofeedback system. There was uh, looking at absolute power, 
uh, phase problems and, and coherence problems. There were 253 variables uh, at baseline. Doing nothing, no, no, uh, no training at this specific, just generating the theta crossover state, a huge decrease in the number of dysregulated errors. So dysregulation was defined as, as variables that uh, were two standard deviations or greater. So we get to getting into theta crossover state, a decrease in anxiety, mood, uh, dorsal attention, some increase in the dysregulation of uh, ventral attention, uh, default mode network decreases, executive system, that also increases a little bit in dysregulation. Salience becomes hugely uh, more regulated and the pain network may have a marginal dip. This is another way of looking at that same data, which, which kind of suggests that uh, part of the way that uh, alpha theta training works when it produces the theta crossover state is to, uh, it, it's not just affecting the uh, PZ, uh, PZ, it's also affecting the underlying posterior cingulate cortex, uh, which is a major hub of the default mode network, and that has reverberations throughout a lot of uh, the Brodmann areas and the networks that, uh, that are, are functionally cobbled together. So implications. Uh, Alpha-theta training at PZ alters frequencies other than alpha and theta as well. It alters the activity of Brodmann areas and neural networks. The resting spontaneous eyes closed EEG is uh, the electrophysical signal of the hypnagogic state. There are many paths to hypnagogia, including uh, flotations and, and long-term meditations, but uh, alpha-theta training is one of those many and is systematic and can be objectively tracked. Hypnagogia and mindfulness meditation have similar neurophysiological effects, especially with respect to the posterior cingulate cortex and the default mode network. And it suggests that uh, because there are many different ways to arrive at these states, the protocols might be combined to enhance the outcomes such as decreased cravings, addictions, increasing well-being, increasing hypnotic responsiveness, increased, uh, hip increased creativity, and decreasing costs. Um, further explorations include uh, you know, we, we can see that there are beneficial increases with alpha and theta. Uh, how does that fit with uh, other patterns of information that says slow wave excesses can compromise uh, cortical functioning and psychological functioning? There's a lot of basic data about the spontaneous resting eyes closed EEG that's undocumented. But what's its normal course? Is uh, what are what are the uh, range? Uh, they just there's, there's very little published research that I was able to access. And, and um, some people say 10 minutes, but I'm also wondering whether 30 minutes, 90 minutes, or even 120 minutes might give us um, even more useful information. There's a question of how neuro, alpha theta neurofeedback work. Uh, it's typically explained as operant conditioning. Um, but if it were operant conditioning, how do we explain the spontaneous decrease in alpha and the spontaneous increase in theta when the contingencies of reinforcement haven't changed? Um, how does training at O1 or PZ become associated with amplitude and connectivity changes in the, uh, the 19 channel surface recording? Um, Clinical applications have been limited to residential treatments. Can we cobble together technologies that would be useful in non-residential uh, settings? And how, uh, basically, how can we combine these technologies for uh, the efficacy of beneficial outcomes and the efficiency of cost containment? So that is my presentation. If people have questions, uh, 
please feel free to stay on for a few minutes and go ahead and ask. Well, this is Jay. If I, uh, I I was hoping that there would be an inquisitive student asking a question first, but uh, I, I can't contain myself, as everyone knows anyway. So uh, excellent. Uh, uh, a couple comments. Um, uh, John Griselier did some very nice work on pre-post QEG uh, in Alpha Theta training in the Royal College of of, uh, of uh, in London, um, and they basically found decreases in beta following the alpha theta training and you might think of this as like well why was there could be a change in a a, a band that wasn't really um, a, a, an immediate part of the alpha theta uh, up training aspect of this but alpha theta training is actually training hypoperfusion and beta is hyperperfusion and if you learn to turn off your perfusion, you're not stuck with the excess beta that you might have had in the first place. So it, it, it actually makes some good sense. Um, by the way, um, Alpha Theta training is now part of the core curriculum uh, at the Conservatoire of Music at the Royal um, uh, College uh, there in London. Um, oh. It was uh, uh, tested in a double-blind uh, uh, way against all sorts of other techniques. And it was the one thing that did a, a reliably good job of enhancing the, re, the creativity of the musicians. And that's like Juilliard. I mean, it, they're already all great in the first place. So uh, anything that can tweak their uh, creativity up uh, was definitely uh, a plus. So it's, it's now part of the core curricula. Everybody that goes there does alpha theta training. Um, uh, you mentioned our study on addiction. Um, that was published much more recently, but we actually had done work back in the early 70s when I was at the state hospital, the first state hospital lab to be uh, available with biofeedback, and uh, uh, it was EEG biofeedback then. It was, wasn't even the term neurofeedback, but uh, we did alpha training uh, in alcoholics, and we actually applied to NIH for a grant in 1974 for alpha training in alcoholics, which classically have a low voltage fast EEG pattern, which is obviously observed by Penniston as well. Uh, but the, you know, 1974, uh, the, this was um, actually a little bit before Budzinski's uh, Twilight Learner. Uh, and at the same time, we were working with a float tank environment. Um, and uh, uh, it does, in fact, induce theta in the EEG in a major way uh, to be in a float tank. Sensory deprivation, basically. Now, you can also get that with sensory restriction. Uh, Gonsfeld glasses or uh, a darkened room, uh, as you had mentioned. But the float tank does an exquisite job of it. And uh, we actually uh, did brainwashing in that uh, float tank environment with um, auditory tapes, loops, uh, with the person's voice on it with a message that we want to plug into their unconscious. Uh, the transactional analysis therapy was a, the, the rage at that time. And um, uh, the, the, this was a message that was to re, be replaced. We put it in an underwater speaker. And uh, when people were in the theta state, it would play. When they weren't in the theta state, they were alpha or beta as a dominant state. Uh, there was a pink noise. and the, the, trigger faded out the pink noise and faded in their voice when they entered the theta state. And if they oriented to what the sound was, it would be pink noise again. But as long as they were open focus, really open, um, um, it, it plugged in. And we had uh, huge changes in uh, people's uh, self-concept and stuff within a few sessions in a tank. Um, I actually... Uh, in testing the whole concept, uh, entered the tank with my lab partner's voice on a tape. And I had his voice in my head after a single session for a week or so. So it's really a, a, a potent uh, way to brainwash. Now, we didn't publish about it at the time um, because it was brainwashing. And if you looked at the politics in the 70s, 
it wasn't really a very friendly government time at that point in time. So, you know, I didn't really think Nixon was going to do a great job of, <laughs> of, uh, of handling the, uh, uh, the issues. In fact, um, the, uh, the front page of the newspaper that covered our laboratory in 1974 uh, above the fold on the newspaper there in Jamestown, North Dakota at the State Hospital's hometown. Uh, below the fold there was uh, articles about Nixon and, and the problems in the government and stuff. So it really was not a, a friendly point in time. Um, you, you mentioned the vigilance modeling um, and um, the, the uh, uh, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, and SAGE C as you descend and decrease vigilance. And, um, the, the software that can do that actually uh, does exist. It's called VIGAL, like Vigilance Algorithm. Uh, and it basically identifies in the eyes closed EEG second by second by second what state you would be in um, uh, in uh, vigilance terms. Uh, so there are people that have quantified it to the point that it's an algorithm that can actually sort through. And there is a huge benefit to not throwing away big pieces of the EEG and actually looking at its contiguous process as reflected with a level of conscious uh, function. And, and Gerald Ulrich's uh, book, by the way, is a very good book. I wrote a, a, a review of it on Amazon. And uh, he, he does uh, look at that dynamic of, of regulation of vigilance. And there are people who have labile vigilance regulation, hyper-stable vigilance regulation. So it's, it's an important aspect of looking at the EG to not just cut it up and look at the average background, but to actually look at the, the time dynamics lost when you do the analysis. So, um, you know, the raw EG is still, uh, I think, really quite useful. Um, uh, in your data set, by the way, very nice presentation on the source analysis on alpha theta, uh, pointing to the cingulate for the theta state. And the, the alpha state is obviously thalamocortical. And in normal alpha, the posterior cingulate does have the default mode hub um, at the posterior cingulate. But the theta state had the entire cingulate, which suggests that the theta is actually limbically generated not thalamocortically generated. And that's probably why the crossover states end up being an either or. Um, it, 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 your thalamocortical system has to stabilize and get out of the way for the limbic system to uh, uh, represent itself. And the limbic system generally means unconscious material. So the theta crossovers are when a lot of the more florid um, uh, abreactive uh, circumstances happen as well. Um, there are some, um, in our work we found some people that responded well enough clinically with just training alpha. Uh, and the, the, re the requirement for theta crossovers uh, is something that is um, uh, something the therapist basically needs to decide whether the uh, um, whether the patient's uh, circumstances resolved by simply learning how to have produced good alpha. In the alcoholics that have low voltage fast EEGs, the, they actually have a change in kind in their EEG after alpha training. They have alpha. Um, mm -hmm. Roselier's work showed decreased beta. His work was in normals. If you take a low voltage fast EEG group and do alpha theta training, not only do you have decreased beta, but you now have increased alpha. In fact, you now have alpha. Uh, low voltage fast EEGs very seldom have a, a, a discernible alpha peak. And if they do, it's usually way fast, 12, 13 hertz, but well, not well formed. So um, uh, the, the, the dropping of arousal um, to, by training alpha, especially the 8 to 10 hertz range in the alpha band, uh, sometimes gives people clinical relief in dropping their arousal level to the point where they don't have clinical complaints anymore. Whether they have to do theta crossovers is something that the therapist and the client need to kind of figure out. Now, if you've got, you know, deep trauma of some sort, you probably are going to have to address it with a, a full alpha theta crossover and all that. But there are a lot of people that just have over arousal and learning alpha sometimes is sufficient for them. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, uh, uh, nice work, uh, on, nice presentation on the source analysis. Uh, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't take a large group n in order to demonstrate something. Sometimes, in fact, case studies are how psychiatry has moved forward typically. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I. I I'm uh, I'm not put off by a presentation of an N01 uh, data set. In fact, it's a good uh, case illustration of crossovers, and um, it it, um, it is representative of data that I've seen as well. So, um, uh, you know, nice work. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, added comments and, and information. Sure, uh, Jerry. Th this is Rich. Uh, yes. Two things. One, I hope you'll present your N of one data at AAPB as a poster. And I will be happy. you did. I, I will be happy to do that. To, uh, I'll, I'll put it together for a submission. Great. And second, you were, as I recall from our discussions, you were looking to extend this work and thought that some of our graduate students might be interested, correct? Absolutely. I think there's, uh, there's some excellent ways that, uh, that uh, you know, just even exploring the, uh, the eyes closed TEG, looking more about uh, uh, what happens in the, uh, the alpha and alpha theta states. Uh, uh, I think there's some really exciting things that uh, they can build on the, the great uh, uh, summaries that, uh, that Jay provided and, and that uh, Bruce Lea and, and uh, Penniston and, and, uh, and, and Green that, I mean, to my mind, I'm still kind of thinking, with this amazing technology, how come, how come that isn't the greatest thing around? Uh, but I think uh, there's a lot of folks who aren't aware of how powerful this can be in, in useful ways. Absolutely. Are there any other comments or questions? Actually, in the high-end uh, addiction treatment centers in Malibu, uh, these kinds of therapies are being offered. Uh, so it, it isn't that this isn't uh, uh, recognized in the therapeutic community. Uh, it, it's not as utilized as it needs to be, but there aren't a lot of people out there showing them that they know how to do it. Uh, uh, if, a, if a treatment group is interested in it, um, they still need to have somebody there that can do it. And it's not like alpha theta training therapists are knocking down their doors. So um, yes. <laughs> uh, that uh, it, it's utilized uh, when uh, therapists that know how to do it are available to the treatment centers and they are getting very good outcomes. Uh, our, our work was one of those centers, basically, the N of 30. By the way, we did have 100% clean and sober at one year. Wow. And uh, the, the two-thirds of them got alpha theta training because that's what their phenotypes requested. The, the, if you've got a phenotype, there's a, a match to the phenotype. It's kind of a, if you have that hand, here's how to play it. Um, and, and if you have over arousal, alpha theta was definitely part of the training. Uh, fast alpha, low voltage fast EEGs, and beta spindles are over arousal patterns that get alpha theta as part of the training. Um, but one third of the population had an anterior cingulate issue independent of the fact that the arousal stuff is usually related to the speed of alpha at the posterior cingulate. So the anterior cingulate related patterns uh, is a totally different drive mechanism than over arousal. And, and it's, a, it's an obsessive compulsive drive. And one third of the addicted population that we studied had an obsessive compulsive drive. And if you just did alpha theta with them, you would have missed the anterior cingulate's uh, um, you know, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive drive. And we basically got rid of the drive mechanisms and the behaviors went away. And that's how it's supposed to behave in psychology when you you talk about yes. drive mechanisms and everything you get rid of the drive the behavior associated with it, go away and um, we're we're basically dealing with getting rid of the over arousal drive with the alpha theta um, and some pretreatment uh, for for a couple of the patterns 
more similar to the Scott protocol, having some SMR or beta or suppressed training prior to the alpha theta. If you've got an alpha problem or a theta problem and you don't deal with that first, you can end up having a problem. So uh, the, the Scott protocol was developed because of the observations of difficulties with the Penison protocol uh, having problems for some people. Uh, if you had an alpha style ADD and you learned alpha, you weren't getting better attentionally. You might have your addiction fixed with the alpha theta training, but your ADD may still be florid. So uh, th there are times when you need to deal with an alpha problem or a theta problem first. I, I would like to add, this is Cynthia, hi everyone, oh, hi, Cynthia. Yeah, um, about to go into print is um, a book on the history and the, um, the evolution of the Alpha Theta Protocol um, that I co-edited with uh, Antonio Martins Moreo. And it literally is about to go into print and should be available for ISNR. So, um, I think, Jerry, um, I was listening to your, your, your story, and I think you'd really appreciate the book. <laughs> yes, I've, I've been, uh, ever since I heard it was coming out, I've been eagerly awaiting. Well, it'll be out in September. Excellent. Okay, we're about uh, 19 minutes over, so we've got to cut off, unless there are any pressing questions. If you have any more questions, go ahead and send me an email, and I'll forward them to Jerry. And Jerry, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. You had plenty of people, so yay. Hey there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. Bye.